Chapter 7, Learning Objectives. We'll talk about what a contract is, the elements, different types of contracts, and in detail about what is an offer, when it can be revoked, acceptance, and consideration. And what we find is these terms sometimes mean something different than we think. For example, consideration. When I say consideration, you say, I'll think about it. Cons I'll consider it. What else might you think? In light of tomorrow being Valentine's Day, consideration is being nice, right? But we find out in the chapter it has nothing to do with either one of those. So we'll talk about what consideration is legally. We need contracts. Business law is a lot about contracts. We've introduced civil law and criminal law, but uh, we're going to spend quite a few classes on what contracts are, um, breach of contract, damages when a contract's breached. And we need them because they set out the rights and duties of parties. Now, we talked about rights already. What is a right? Like we talked about constitutional rights, didn't we? It's something that we we get, isn't it? So in a contract, rights are what we get, and duties are something we have to do, something we have to give. So in a contract to buy a car, I have a right to get the car, and I have a duty to do what? Yeah, so that's rights and duties. And just like in every other chapter, we got to name the parties. The promisor is the one who makes the promise, and the promisee is the one who accepts the promise, or the one the promise is made to. And you're going to see or and e a lot, assign or, assign e, dead or, dead e, throughout the, the course. So here's the definition of a contract, in case you <coughs> missed it. An agreement that can be enforced in court. Because I saw a lot of an agreement. Well, not every agreement that we make or promise that we make is enforceable in court, is it? Thinking of Valentine's Day again, if I say, I promise to love you all forever. Well, you know, what are you going to do if I don't? Cry. Yeah, maybe cry, maybe your feelings be hurt, maybe it'll be, yippee, good deal. But there's nothing you can really do about that. You can't really enforce that in court. So a contract also involves two or more parties. You can't contract with yourself because the first element of a contract is agreement. You have to agree with someone else. Okay, But it's not limited to just two. It could be more. So often, even the book talks about the two parties to a contract, but there could be many parties to a contract. If you don't uh, follow through with your promises, then that's called a breach in contract language. And if you breach the contract, the other party is entitled to damages. The objective theory may be something that you haven't heard before. The objective theory of contract says we're not going to look at the subjective intent, the mind of the parties. We're going to look at what they put in writing. So think about it. There's a lawsuit and the contract says the price was $10,000. You go to court and you tell the judge, but I really only meant to pay eight. It wasn't worth ten. Right? The judge says, so what? Objectively, looking at this piece of paper here, you agreed to ten. That's what you agreed to. That's what you're going to pay. All right. A valid, enforceable contract has all these elements. And from your chapter, agreement had two parts to it. What were they? In order to have an agreement between two or more parties, you have to have a blank and a blank. Offer. Offer. Acceptance. acceptance. Okay. So agreement has two components to it. We'll talk about each one of those. Consideration, anything of value that's exchanged. Your, your chapter calls it bargained for. So why don't they just say money? Because that's what it usually is. It might be something else, right? What else could you exchange? Property, services, um, other goods in exchange for it. So they call it consideration because it's confusing, I guess. It's, just, it's not just money. It's other things, too. Capacity. Capacity, I mean, if you think back, um, we talked about 
defenses to crimes and whether you had the capacity to commit the crime, what kind of things affected capacity then? Right, your mental capacity. So capacity really has two components. One, are you mentally capable of understanding the contract? And what kind of things would affect that? Age. Your age, good. What else might affect your mental capacity? Yes, I, I went out uh, and looked at some of your Facebook sites out there. Apparently some of you have issues with uh, capacity at times. Uh, and the other component of it is capacity in terms of are you the right person to be making the agreement? I mean, what if I said to you, hey, I purchased a car, I purchased a car for you. You're like, well, cool, thanks. No, no I, I purchased it on your behalf. You have to pay for it. You'd probably say, no. You didn't have the capacity. You didn't have the ability to enter into a contract for me. If I'm an agent of yours, maybe, but generally I can't just enter into contracts for people. And then legality. Even if both parties agree, money is exchanged or something of value is exchanged, and the parties appear to have the capacity, if it's not for a legal purpose, it's not a valid contract. So, I, um, Joel, I want, I want you dead, and I'm going to hire someone to kill you. Right? So, I enter, into a con I enter into an agreement with someone else. Uh, we, you know, although my capacity is questionable, uh, we enter into an agreement. Uh, how much would that be? What would it take? Hundred grand. So consideration is there, and um, seems like a contract, right? Well, if we define a contract as an agreement that be enforced in court, what would happen if, like, no one kills you, and I'm like, I take some, take the person to court and say, Judge, they didn't kill him. I want my hundred thousand dollars back, or I want him to kill him, right? The judge can't enforce the contract because that means you're dead. Right? So it has to have a legal purpose. All right, defenses. Genuineness of assent has to do with the parties agreeing to the same thing. So sometimes we actually have mistaken uh, understandings of what the contract's about. I'll buy that red car there. You think I'm talking about a different red car. We don't have a meeting of the minds. Or the form of the contract. How many of you think contracts have to be in writing to be enforceable? No one's ever heard that before? I hear crickets out there. Yes. See, now, that's what a lot of people think. If it's not in writing, it's not a contract. There are. And yes, it makes it more difficult to prove because if we say contracts are enforceable in court, trying to get an oral contract enforced is difficult. But what kind of things could we look at to say there must have been an oral contract? Right. What if someone has the money in their bank account and the other person has started to act? You know, why else would they have done that? So... Some contracts do have to be in writing, though. Like a contract for the purchase of real estate. Very complicated transaction. You wouldn't want to orally agree to that. And the law says that has to be in writing. So another defense to enforcement of a contract is it, it wasn't in writing when it had to be in writing. But it doesn't always have to be in writing. All right. Another way to look at contracts is the different types of contracts. For example, bilateral, by means two. To what? No. Darn. Because every contract involves at least two parties. That's the most common guess. Did it talk about bilateral contracts in your chapter? It sounds familiar. What page was that on? Yes, so two promises, right? There's... There's a promise that's made by both parties. Let's say, for example, I want my uh, driveway snow plowed. So I enter into contract for the, that whole season where I agree to pay a certain amount per month and another party agrees to plow my driveway. 
from the moment that we make those promises, it's a contract and it's enforceable. So how would you breach that contract? Right. One of the parties doesn't do what they're supposed to. So both parties make a promise. They're both enforceable. Versus unilateral contract. Uni means one what? Promise. So if only one of the parties is prom promising, what's the other party doing? Performing. Right? So unilateral contracts sound familiar? Let's see here. Page 204. Hence, a unilateral contract is a promise for an act. And there is an example there. If you drive my car from New York to Los Angeles, I'll give you $1,000. That's a promise to give someone $1,000 if they do what? Make a promise? No. If they act, they perform. So what would have to happen and before that obligation to pay the thousand dollars? Yeah. Okay. So sometimes in exchange for a promise we get an act versus another promise. What if I tell my neighbor kid, I'll give you fifty bucks if you mow my lawn? Is that a contract? If yes. If he mows my lawn. And only if he mows my lawn. Let's say I come home after work. Lawn's not mowed. Has he breached contract? No, because there's no contract yet. There's not a contract until he mows my lawn. And then he's entitled to the $50. So why make the big deal between one or two promises? Because it makes a difference whether a contract is formed and whether we can sue someone for breaching it or not. How could I fashion that contract with a neighbor kid so that it was a bilateral contract and I would know when it's breached. Right, we reach an agreement. He makes promise to mow before 5 o'clock or something. I make a promise to pay. I come home after 5 o'clock, the lawn's not mowed. You guys can probably see me that with my neighbor kid out with a written contract making him <laughs> sign it and perform a promise. Uh, lotteries are an example. Why are lotteries an example of a unilateral contract? Let's back up again. Right. If you perform an act, what's the act you have to perform? Not just winning. Buying the ticket and presenting the winning number, right? I mean, what would it be like if you... I don't play the lotto or anything, but what would be a lottery ticket? I don't know. What, what, what's the name of a... Mega Millions. All right. So you go into the store and you say, I'll have a Mega Millions ticket. How much does that cost? A dollar, they give you the ticket and you go, all right, give me my mega millions, right? And they're like, no, that's not the way it works. You have to win. Oh, no, I paid my consideration. doesn't work that way. Or you call and say, look, I got the winning number. Pay up. And they're going to say what? Show us, right? Perform the act. The act is presenting the winning ticket. So, another reason why we care about Unilateral contracts involving one promise and one act is that and traditionally we could revoke the offer before it was accepted. So before my neighbor kid starts mowing my lawn, I could say, never mind. That makes sense? Under the modern view, once the neighbor kid starts mowing the lawn or has changed his or her position, then I shouldn't revoke my offer. I mean, what if I just watch him and then they get all the hard parts done. I go, ah, okay, never mind. I revoke my offer. Probably can see me doing that too. But uh, So under the modern view, once the other party has started to perform, even though they haven't fully performed, you got to let them finish their performance and pay them. If I said to you, I'll give you 100 bucks if you walk across the Mackinac Island or Mackinac Bridge, right? you get about halfway across and I say, I revoke my offer you can continue to walk across and get paid. All right, express versus implied. You guys are kind of 
quiet and I'm going to have to incorporate some kind of... So I, I might end up on the floor. All right. So express an implied contract. Of course, I don't know how I'm going to do this if I'm tethered to the computer. Express contracts are either written or oral. They're expressed somehow. A lot of people think contracts are either written or oral. But express contracts could be written or oral. Implied contracts are neither written nor oral. So how can you have a contract when you didn't put anything in writing and you didn't say anything? It's up there. When might you have a contract? By the actions, by the conduct of the parties. If you don't believe that, try this. Go into a grocery store, load up your cart, and then go through the checkout and, and just let them ring everything up. And then when they say that'll be $400, just stare at them. Right? And then they're like, $400, please, and just say, I never offered to purchase this. Just try that as an experiment. Let me know what happens. Right? I mean, a lot of things that we do are implied contracts, aren't they? I mean, when you come up to the cash register, they don't whip out a written contract and go, would you like to purchase groceries from here? Sign here. No, it's just implied. You're there. You're putting the stuff in your cart. You go through it that you want to buy it. Okay. Implied in law contracts are what kind of contracts? Yeah, they're not really contracts, which why call them contracts if they're not really contracts? But there's an example of this in your chapter of a fictional or quasi-contract. I had a friend who used to call it quasi-contract, but it's actually quasi. What's the example in your chapter? Suppose that a very chastening physician is driving down the highway and encounters Emerson, who is lying unconscious on the side of the road. The physician renders medical aid that saves Emerson's life. Although the injured, unconscious Emerson did not solicit the medical aid and was not aware that the aid had been rendered, Emerson received a valuable benefit and the requirements for a quasi-contract were fulfilled. In such a situation, the law normally will impose a quasi-contract and Emerson will have to pay the physician for the reasonable value of the medical services provided. Good. What do you think of that example? Isn't that the stupidest example you ever heard? I mean, like it's a doctor that runs around looking for unconscious people, helps them out, and then slaps a bill on their chest. <laughs> Pay up. I don't think it really works that way, but I've come up with lots of stupid examples, so I guess we'll give the publisher a break. So usually this is the time, although I'm tethered to a microphone, where I usually give you better examples, so I'll do my best to give it to you. Let's say, for example, I'm really excited about contracts, which I am. And in my um, presentation, I go to slap on this podium and I miss, bonk, knock myself out. I'm slumped over my computer here. What are you guys going to do? Yeah. Go home. Presentation's <laughs> off. Next class. Right? So call 911. No one comes. What are you going to do? Take me to the hospital. It's right across the street. Right? So you wheel me into the hospital, right? And I'm on a stretcher, and they're like, they've all taken business law, so they know the deal on contracts. And they wheel me in. You guys wheel me in, and they say, Sir, would you like medical treatment? And I say, I'm unconscious. Right? So then they go, Oh, 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 I know. Written. Right? Sign here. Nothing. Right? Because I'm unconscious. Then they go, oh, I got it. Conduct. Let's watch him and see what he does. And I do nothing, right? Because I'm unconscious. No flinches, no, nothing that would indicate. Other, I guess perhaps my bleeding might give them some clue, right? What's that? I am all over the place, right? But I don't know I am. I'm unconscious. So they treat me. They wrap me up. I come to. A few of my really dedicated students are there waiting to see if I come to. Right? The rest of you are here waiting in class for me to come back. 
Okay. <laughs> this is just an example. And um, I wake up, oh, oh man, I got to get back to class. Right? So I go to walk out and they go, hey, you need to pay your bill. You know, like this example here. And I say, hey, look at this suit. I'm an attorney, right? I mean, you can't mess with me. I don't have a contract with you, do I? No. I just went through it. Is there a written contract anywhere? Is there an oral contract anywhere? Did I do anything? I didn't do anything. Right? There's, but there's going to be a quasi-contract. So an implied-in-law contract is a contract where there wasn't a contract that the court whips up after the fact. So I go to court and I go, I'm not paying because I didn't sign anything. And the court says, look, we understand there wasn't a contract, but you can't get away with this. And uses its equitable powers that we talked about to fashion a remedy, which is basically whip up a contract where there wasn't one, to avoid unjust enrichment. So why should I get the value of the service but not have to pay? The other reason we have this is not just protect the hospital, but how does it protect me? What would happen if we didn't have quasi-contract? They would just watch me. <laughs> is he going to do something? Is he going to say something? Is he going to sign anything? Right. So this says, look, this is the business hospitals are in. People aren't always conscious, and they got to be able to give them service. All right. I've been thinking of doing that scenario with some real blood and stuff, but that would be messy. Fake real blood, yeah. All right. Another way to look at contracts is formal versus informal. Quasi-blood. Yes, fictional blood. Now, again, sometimes people think formal, written, informal, oral, but that's not what this means. Formal contracts are a, a small group of contracts that the law says have to be in a special form to be enforceable. Everything else is an informal contract. So if you guys are taking notes of anything on this slide, all oral contracts and most written contracts are informal. You get all the elements, it doesn't matter if you put it on a cocktail napkin, subject to some of the defenses that we've talked about. Only when the law says you got to put it this way. Think of a check. You know, you can write a check on most anything, believe it or not, but if it doesn't have a particular form, if it doesn't have all the elements, it's not a contract. Does that make sense? A deed, same thing. So if it's under seal, which I can't think when the last time I saw a contract with a wax seal on it, but if it has to be has to be notarized to be enforceable, if it has to have a particular form, then it's a formal contract. Everything else is informal. Executed versus executory. It says both sides, but if all sides have done everything they're supposed to, it's executed. If any of the parties haven't done everything they're supposed to, it's executory. Yeah. Um, this is about a contract with an upside. Um, why would you need a formal one? Sometimes the law says you need this particular thing in your contract or we wouldn't understand what you're trying to do. For example, on a check, what kind of things do you need to have on a check? A signature, right? Which shows what? That that was your intent to pay, okay, so is that like and a date, and a an amount. Okay. So without those things, you know, then the law would say it really isn't what you tried to make it. So executory, a lot of contracts are executory. Think about it. You go to buy a car, and when is it executed? When is that kind of contract executed? Right, which sometimes is cash, but a lot of times it's you get the car, but you make payments over time. It doesn't become executed until you've made all the payments. This is important because if you have a contract with someone else and they're making installment payments, you have a right 
to enforce that contract all along until it's executed. What happens with a contract once it's executed? Think about it. It's done. It's performed. And then what happens to it? It is no more. Right? So if everyone does everything they're supposed to be, it's an executed contract. It's discharged. It is no more. All right, valid contract we already talked about. These are the three V's, valid, void, and voidable. A valid contract is the contract that has all the elements of a contract. This one's a little tricky. A voidable contract is a valid contract that someone can back out of. So think about it. What would be a kind of voidable contract? What's the most common? At least from your chapter. Someone could enter into contract but then decide they want to get out of it. Miners. Yeah. Which is different than what some people believe. About as common as the myth that oral contracts aren't contracts is the one that miners can't contract, which is, which is not true. In fact, if you think about it, when you were a miner, didn't you contract for things? You probably worked. You probably purchased things at the store. Cell phones. A lot of people have cell phones while they're miners. But you might still be able to do it. You can't? No, you have to be 18. Really? Yeah, otherwise you can't work for it. Oh. Anybody had a contract for a cell phone before they were 18? Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Most most classes, someone says, yeah, I had I had a phone. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty common policy. It's not really a law, but it's pretty common policy that that uh, providers won't let minors contract or they'll have someone sign with them. Oh, so they would let you do it as long as they can get enough money out of you? They do a, they do a credit check. Yeah, they'll do a credit check and obviously if you're mining, it's probably going to have to credit. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So sometimes they let you do that. But, and probably the reason they do this is it's voidable. As a miner, you can back out of it. I had this happen to me when I was younger, which was two or three years ago. Um, <laughs> you say this is a made up story. Oh, yeah. When I was a miner, I uh, went to the Woodland Mall. And, <laughs> yes, they had malls back then. And across the uh, way, there was a car dealership. I think they tore it down or rebuilt it now. But it was right across the, the street from the mall. And I went over there, and they always had these nice cars out on the lawn. And they had a Corvette. And I went over there. And, the, you know, back then, I mean, if you try to, to drive a Corvette now, what do you have to do? Right. And then I think they let you watch while they drive it. You know, I don't think they actually let you drive a Corvette. So, um, but he just, the guy just says, you want to try it out? Sure. So I drive it around, come back, and this, this car is awesome, right? So he lays out all the figures and everything, and I'm thinking, I can do this. I got a job, right? So I contract to buy this Corvette. I go across the street. My parents come out, go to get in the minivan. They see me, like, I won't really, I'll paraphrase what my father said to me, but it's something about taking the car back, right? So, can I take the car back? Yeah, because it was a valid contract. It had all the elements, but I, as a miner, could take it back. Now, this part didn't happen, but what, do, what would miners typically do once they have a Corvette? Right, right. You know, punch it, lose control, crash it. If I if I damage it or it loses value after I buy it, can I take it back? Yes, most of the time you can. But you have yes, you have to take back what you took, which I don't know, doesn't necessarily have to be a suit, but the value of whatever it is. Um, but there are some jurisdictions where they say no, you you can't do that, 
and especially if you lie about your age, which didn't happen. None of that happened. I did make that story up, but if it had happened, that I know you're writing in your notes. He's telling the truth right now. Backspace, backspace, liar. All right, void. A void contract is no contract. So kind of like I said, quasi contract is not one. A void contract isn't a contract either. A void contract doesn't have the elements, so it's not a contract to start with. Illegal contracts are void contracts, as an example. What if a miner tries to buy alcohol? Is it a valid contract that they can back out of? No, it's a void contract. You can't contract to do things that are illegal. Buy cigarettes, buy alcohol, whatever else that the law says miners can't do. That contract is void. All right, we talked about implied law contracts. Talked about the elements of an agreement. Um, offers. There are different ways to terminate offers. The parties could say, we don't want to do this deal. The party that makes the offer, the offeror, could revoke their offer. We talked about limitations on that. But if I'm selling my car out in the front lawn before anyone accepts that offer, I could say, I don't want to sell it anymore. Or it could be a rejection by the offeree. And then it says, or counter offers. What if I say, I'll sell you my car for 10 and you say, I'll pay you 8. Is that an acceptance? Right, it's a rejection and a counter offer. So a counter offer serves to reject the original offer. And now the roles are switched around. The person that said, I'll pay you eight, is the offeror, and the party who's selling the car is now the offeree. That makes sense? Like we just swapped roles there. Sometimes the law terminates the offer. The law says uh, the offeror is dead. It's difficult to accept. Um, or whatever that was, the car that was the subject of the transaction has been destroyed. It, there's no uh, subject matter there to, to buy. Mm, termination of offers. I think we talked about most of those. Um, there's a little more depth here in operation of law. Sometimes we say an offer is only good for a certain period of time. You might see that in advertising. If we're incompetent, that uh, gets rid of, the, terminates the offer. Or if something that was legal becomes illegal to sell a particular chemical that no longer is legal to sell. Did I go backwards there? I don't know what happened. Consideration, we talked about that. It has two elements, legally sufficient value and it's bargained for. This will come in handy when you get to the uh, case problems that you're going to do. What is consideration and when is it missing? Here are situations where the contract lacks consideration. I already have a duty to do what I'm promising to do. I'm a police officer. You live next door to me. I say, I'll give, if you give me $5,000, I'll guard your house. All right? But I already have a pre-existing duty to do that. Perhaps I already have a contract with you to do something and then I try to charge you more for doing the same thing. That's not consideration. Or you've already paid the consideration. Or sometimes we say things that sound like they're a promise but they're not really. I'll buy your car if I can. Sounds like a promise to buy a car but it's not really. Accord and satisfaction. How many of you have credit cards in here? A few of you. What are your credit card numbers? Okay, I'm just kidding. All right, so you have a credit card with B, for, uh, and you owe five thousand dollars on it. You can't pay. B's trying to collect. Oh, is it more? <laughs> Fifteen thousand. Oh, okay, good. All right, good. So five hundred. Yeah. Wow, good deal. You're not the. Uh, the national average. 
So uh, you can't pay the $500. They threaten to sue you. You say, I'll give you 100 bucks now. They got two options, right? One, they could say, it's better to have 100 bucks now than nothing later. I'll take the $100. So that's an accord and satisfaction. The accord is, I'll give you 100 even though I owe you 500 And the satisfaction is, ah, yes, I will take the $100. See that satisfied? Ah. All right. But if it's not an accord and satisfaction and you give your credit card company $100, what do they say in return? You still owe us $400, right? So don't think this means you just give the credit card company less money and they're happy. Only if you reach an agreement. A release could be consideration. I'll give up some right that I have. For example, maybe I have a lawsuit against you, but I agree to give up something in exchange for that. I won't sue you. I won't enforce this right if you do something for me. All right, promissory estoppel, probably the toughest concept in a chapter. I like to think of this as you are stopped from getting out of your promise. This relates to what I was saying about offers that you can't revoke. If you promise somebody something, then it would be unfair after they rely on it to take the promise back. That's basically what it means. So I tell my kid, I'll give you my land to build on. I didn't have to do that, right? They didn't even give me consideration for it. They start building and I go, ah, I changed my mind. They've already changed their position. They've already invested money. They've already started building. I can't back out. The law says under this equitable doctrine, once the other party has started to substantially rely, it would be unfair for me to take my promise back. That's pretty much all it means. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, it wouldn't be fair for me to change my position and rely on all that for them to say, now I, we take back our offer. Good. All right. Questions about Chapter 7? All right. I'm going to pull up your group activity then. So if you haven't seen this, pretty much the top of it and the rubric is the same as the first group activity you did. So how it's graded is the same, the point value is the same, and the scenarios are in your book. So if you go to pages 233 through 235 of your textbook, you should see these five case problems. You have the rest of the time to work together in the groups that you had from the first presentation. I'll be here and available if you have any questions. Go.